Chairperson of the Northern Murray Basin, uh, Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations, and I'm also the chair of the Murray People's Council uh, of the Murray Republic. Can you tell us about the impacts of colonisation and upstream development on your lands? When we get the um, slideshow working, uh, just uh, while we're doing that, we've had some great speakers today. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very impressed with the way that, that um, people are doing things and um, looking after the Mother Earth and um, just make this observation. The Murray people we declared our, our independence from Great Britain in uh, March 2012. We created our own constitution and in our own constitution we have the rights of Mother Earth. And the constitution in the Murray Republic protects Mother Earth, Earth's right and it punishes us if we do anything against it. Against so I'm not here to talk about that though, I'll talk about um, the Murray Darling Basin. Uh, firstly, in saying that, I'd like to acknowledge all of the sovereign First Nations um, of the continent of Australia, particularly the sovereign First Nations in the northern Murray Darling Basin where I, I, I conduct business, and acknowledge there that they have never ceded their sovereignty and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and encourage elders of the future to lead with honour, dignity and respect for all. So, I'm going to go through three stages. One is, um, we, we, we were talking about law this morning, we are talking about connection and all that type of stuff as well. So, this is our landscape management process. Don't be greedy, don't take any more than you need and respect everything around you. This whole forward here is from a little place called Kanamala out west, and he's going to tell you a little story.
might have to make some people to make cry, and he'd go down underground and follow the chapters of another water system until he got punished enough. And then he might come back and change this up around and he'd come back again. So that was the hour we learned about what he do. He had to look after the water. As I said, that was the people who were doing the protection for sale and for sale and for years. And uh, some kind of misuse of resources. Sorry, Frank. Yeah, just let, just let the, the audio go. Just let the audio yeah. go. That's fine. Yeah. Go. Start from the top, folks. Sorry. That's all right. Some kind of misuse of resources. Yeah, they could dry the water out. My head would make some people bed dry, and he'd go down underground and follow the chapters of another water system until he got punished enough. And then he might come back and change this up around and he'd come back again. So that was the hour we learned about protecting the water. You, know, you had to look after the water. As I said, Aboriginal people were doing the protection for sale and for sale and for years. And, uh, and even today, I think I really want to mention about the new and thinking about the, the laws of the world. It wasn't an unwritten law wherever the level of the normal water level of water I was. Uh, no one could claim any ground within, say, two, two couple of metres up from that. That was water, that was the land that was not even Aboriginal or anyone else. That was where water was allowed to flow free to people below you. Yeah. Um, yeah, that. So, that's, that's, a, that's the way we manage land as First Nations people and as First Nations. Now I'd like to show you how you manage land as so, um, yeah, just out of the way for uh, non-First Nations people manage land. If we can get this one going, I've got somebody in New South Wales that's going to be able to tell you also. You know, you're right, Jeremy, I'm thinking, one of the country states from the Indira Band in southern Queensland, and this is the Coldwell River, which should flow on to the Darwin system, but it's being stopped here by this weir, which is siphoned water off into the country system to grow large pots of cotton. And just outside Indira Band, at the massive gin here, we see thousands upon thousands of bales of cotton, all growing in the water that would have gone down the Darwin system. Almost no water is making down, so towns like Broken Hill, the Nindy, and the Darwin system is drying out and dying. It's a national tragedy. The Murray Darwin Basin plan is failing, and it's failing because we do not have the courage to stand up at Big Cop and say this is just not right. So, this is a burning river. Can anybody tell me where this burning river is? It's a Dolby in Queensland. The Economine River is dying. It's on fire. Yeah. Um, this is a stretch of the Murray Darling from Warwick in Queensland and where it runs into the Darling River at Burke. You can see there only 24% of water crosses the, um, the border of New South Wales that runs into um, to, to New South Wales. And it's because of that big development that's upstream. We look at the development of Cubby Station and we say, oh, it's the biggest cotton farm in Australia. But the St George Irrigation area is just as big. There are so many off-farm, oh, sorry, on-farm private storages of water. I hear Barnaby and all of those people saying they need to build dams. Well, they need to look at the dams that they've, they've, they've allowed the cotton 
industry to build, to store water for private use as well. Um, and by only 24% of that water coming across the New South Wales border, New South Wales and Queensland border, it affects, it affects our culture and heritage. It affects our ability to go and fish, to go and collect bush tucker. But also it affects um, our, our nations in a way that at a place called Wollaringal, we have not caught a cod since 2000. The last cod that was caught was during the, two, the millennium drought and it was pulled out of a water hole that went dry um, and that was the last time we ever caught a cod in the, in the Congo River. So what are we doing um, about this? As I said, I'm the chair of the Northern, uh, Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations. We're, we're an organisation that represents 22 sovereign First Nations. Our purpose um, is, but not limited, representing these sovereign First Nations in the Northern Murray-Darling Basin in a, cult uh, in a cultural and natural resource um, on, on those issues. And our aim is to keep our water spirits and connections alive. And in 2012, I was in Perth and I was at Curtin University and somebody that was with me was giving a speech. And after we finished, I walked outside and this, this old Aboriginal guy from over that way, he walked up to me and he said, Fred, and I don't know how he knew my name because I never introduced myself to anybody, I just sat there. He said, you know that wooden gun you talk about over there? And he said, you've got to protect him over there now because they're destroying his home in the Pilbara. So that connection, and I was at a Senate or a House of Representatives inquiry and there was a guy called Warren Hinch or something, not Hinch, Hinch or something from up there in North Queensland. He questioned me on that and he asked me, what are the connections? And the Mundagata, or the Rainbow Serpent, everybody calls it, connects us. Connects every single nation in this country or every single First Nation in this continent. So, so as a part of our job, we, we do a lot of work with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and we undertook a, a major research project over the last six years. And it was based on what they call the Echuca Declaration, which was a declaration that was done um, on the Murray River in Echuca back in 2007. And it looked at how we um, would look at water rights. Um, and one of, the, one of the, the major statements was that there was a cultural flow. And there's a description of what a cultural flow is. And a part of that, what they did was they, done, they undertook two research sites. This research site is 85 kilometres below Cubby Station on a station called Woolmaringle. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a word up there saying um, Kalgara River. Just there, there is a water hole. That's where we caught the last cod. Right? But that water hole is connected to another water hole which is 85 kilometres away um, at a place called Lednapper and there's a spring at Leadnapper. We call it Guerrero Spring. And the spring was a source of water for us. And it's the home of our Wundagata. So basically what happens is the Wundagata, in times of flood or in times that the river would run a banker, would travel and traverse the streams um, and the rivers. And so that Wundagata relied on floods coming down this system. Um, we undertook, undertook a project at Guerrero Springs earlier this year where we worked with the national parks to, to clear it out. You know, we had a, um, one of them big backhoe things, you know, the big things that scooped the, the, the mud and everything out? We had one of those there. They scooped it out. They still couldn't reach the bottom. 
They got as far as high as this building, they couldn't reach the bottom. And it started to fill up with water again, you know? And um, so, and that, the reason why it wasn't running was feral goats. I heard an uncle there talk about feral goats, you know? They, they, they're starting to protect these feral goats. They are a minister in our land. If you can kill every single feral, feral goat, you'd make a lot of us First Nations people very, very happy. Um, and I think that, you know, if we can get rid of those, they're the ones that are clogging up our water systems. Cattle are putting um, all the silt and everything into our rivers and waterways. We've done what we call an Aboriginal waterways assessment program up near Warwick. And you can just see the, the difference between, you know, where it starts at Warwick and then when it gets down into the, to the farmlands um, as well. So, here it comes. So there's two graphs that came out of the, Na the National Cultural Flows Research Project that I used. One is they've done the research and, and they've done the calculations and I don't know how they do it, hydrologists do all this stuff. On the left is pre-development. And how many times that Kuruman Swamp, what we call Kuruman Swamp, was inundated with natural flows. On the right, is post development. Next slide, please. So one of the one of the findings was that we said we need seven thousand megalitres of uh, of water to flow past the gauge of Wollongong to provide Kurum and Swamp with water. When we looked at the hydrology of Kurum and Swamp, it only required one hundred and twenty-five megalitres of water. It's all it required. But we needed 7,000 megalitres to run past the gauge to fulfil the ecosystems that are connected to, to Kuru and Swamp as well. And they said to us, oh, let's just put a pump in, eh? And we'll fill the, pump, uh, the, the swamp up. And we just flatly said no, because we relied on a natural system to provide for us. One thing that I didn't say about the swamp as well, the river red gums that are contained within that swamp has the highest value to us. And in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, they talk about values and uses, indigenous values and uses, objectives and outcomes. Those river red gums have the highest value because they are our spiritual tree. It's where our old people would sit underneath those trees and talk to our ancestors in the, in, in, in the sky camp. And I'll just share a very brief little story. When a baby is, born, um, is in its mother's, mother's womb, it doesn't have a spirit in our in Boroughway culture. So what happens, I, I sort of forgot to um, explain what the flag was up on the top there, um, but well, that's another thing. Um, and before a baby is born, just before a baby is born, the old people would be talking to the, to the ancestors and the spirit would come back on the falling star. So it would ride back to earth in the falling star and it'd jump off and then it'd, it'd hide behind the tree. And when the baby's born, that spirit then jumps straight into that baby's body and gives us its first breath and its life and its soul. That's why those trees are very important to us. Because if we can't connect to our ancestors, we can't tell them all of the important things that has to happen, um, you know, with the connection between us and the sky king. So those river red guns that they talk about have the most highest value. You can never ever get anything higher in Wurrawari culture than that tree. And we, what we call the Bala tree as well in the red country. Oh, sorry, this slide, what this slide here is, is showing. So the mean frequency of events, so pre development, as I said, that swamp would get filled 86 times out of 100 years. Currently, with development upstream, it's 29 times in 100 years. With the full introduction of the basin plan, um, on time, we could probably get it back to 48 times a year uh, in 100 years. So that equates really 
on average pre-development, that swamp would be full um, or would get inundated on average once every three years. That's blowing out now to once in every 15 years and blowing out even further. And um, that's because of development upstream, not for food sources. I must say this, it is not for food sources, it's for cotton. Um, and cotton is a, a big, uh, big issue with, with all of our nations. Thanks very much. The Kremlins. The Kremlins. So, yeah. the Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations um, and the 22 Sovereign First Nations signed a treaty, treaty of unity at the Embassy in Canberra on the 10th of May last year. The Treaty of Unity is amongst the 22 Sovereign First Nations in the Northern Basin. And the treaty combines us. It obligates us, as First Nations people, it obligates us, us to, to look after our, you know, each of the nations and allow for that water to flow to the nation below us. Next one, Bob. Um, as a part of the Cultural Flows Research Project, what came out of that was a, a cultural, flow guide, cultural Flows Guide to First Nations. So it's a guide that's um, built on three stages and ten steps. What the, the Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations have done is we've modified the guide a little bit. And what we've did was um, we're looking at First Nations plans for those First Nations. We're not looking at a little water plan here or a little economic plan over there or something over there. We're looking at a plan for the whole of the nation. Um, and we're using this guide to do it. This, the, when, when the plans are developed, then we are going to then look at um, how we can use these plans to influence international, other international framework like the, um, um, the system of environmental accounting, which is the United Nations framework. So we're doing it through these nation, guiding, uh, nation uh, planning guides. I just come from a gathering of those 22 nations in Gangalindi this week. And we went through the nation planning guide. Next one. And then we did a, na a nation planning assessment using this tool of the botanic gardens in Gangalindi. So they went around, they looked at all the stuff that they planted there and all that, and um, so we, we, we assessed it. And all of the assessment tool, all the, the, the information that's in the assessment tool will actually then be, be put into a, um, a nation plan and we'll develop a nation plan. Each nation, each of the 22 Southern First Nations in the Northern Murray Darwin Basin will go through this process to establish their nation plan or their country plan. Next one, please. And I don't know whether everybody heard about it, but there was an um, announcement by the Minister a while ago, and he said, I'm going to give you, you, you Murray Collins, $20 million or $40 million to buy water, and a whole heap of other things. This is our proposed model to manage that $20 million of water in the Northern Murray Darling Basin. Next one. Uh, I want to finish with this, and then uh, I just got a quick, another video if we get up. Um, Nigel Scully, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, when he was um, addressing the Gama Festival, he said this, it's a time for engagement, for discussion and for truth-telling, for recommitting to good ideas or putting, putting aside bad ones. Scully said he represented the Federal Cabinet at a meeting of the Yulunu leadership in the Dialect Council on Thursday and the two governments and discussed how to work together. If we can do it at a level of nation to nation, then it's possible for every Aboriginal nation across the country to be able to have a crack. If the farmers can work with us, if Uncle there was talking about the kangaroos, he's still here, he's gone. 
If he's talking about the kangaroos, what about all them other animals? What about the emu? They call them gourmet, you know? What about the other animals out there that can be sustainably farmed? You know? Um, so I'll end with one more if we can get it going, brother, and that'll conclude my presentation. And this is about the Darling River. No, it's not there. Not getting it. It's gone. I'm sorry. So powerful gremlins today. Yeah, darn <laughs> it's alright. No, but it's, it, it is a, a poem called The Dying Darling. And I urge you to, to look it up on Facebook or wherever you're going to look it up on. Um, look it up. And it's a guy, it's, it's by a, an old gentleman called William Riley. He was an old Mullingumper man. And um, he, he sat and passed on the other and he talks about his river. And I think it was a good segue into what we're talking about here because he come from Wilkenia on the Darwin River. And, you know, there's been various studies about Wilkenia. And Wilkenia, when the river's not running, there's huge health problems. There are huge crime problems. And that river is running. They have done none of those problems because the kids are out are down there and they're, they're playing in the river and they're, 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 they're being taught by their, their elders about their country. Um, and in a submission to the Murray Darwin Basin Authority in regards to the Northern Basin Review, the kids, we've we done, we done, a, done a, a session at Volcania and the kids that were were discarded from the school system. They weren't welcome in the school system in Wilkenia. They were under this other program. They came in and they sat when we were doing the discussions and they wrote the foreword to their submission to the Murray Darling Basin. And one of the other things that, that, that we did and what we were responsible for, there was a whole heap of changes to the Murray Darling Basin that was to go through the Senate uh, back in February, I think it was. Um, we were, along with the Lifeblood Alliance, we were very, very, um, um, how do I say this? We were very, very influential. Uh, we were very, very, well, we got the politicians to disallow the, uh, disallow the, the amendments to the Murray Basin Authority, which resulted in um, the dealship between Tony Burke and, and uh, Little Prayer in regards to. Um, um, ways of, of helping us in the Northern Murray Basin achieve a whole lot of things. So, um, in saying that, if you look that, that poem up, it's called The Dying Darling, and it's by a, a guy called, um, I like it, William Riley. And um, he tells us how to fix the system. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Department of uh, Agriculture, Department of Environment, the Murray Darling Basin Authority, um, and uh, Hollywood, the Queensland Government, they had representatives there. We broke them up into five different groups, and they were nations. So we, we, we had the Yellow Belly Nation and, and all the other nations. And the nation, they had to go through a process that was uh, set out in the, in the guide. So firstly, they had to form a working group within the nation. 
Then they had to identify all the key stakeholders. They had to then identify the one or two people in their key contacts. And then they did the assessment. So, um, yeah, the Yellow Belly, that was one of the nations, um, uh, hypothetical nations that we used last, um, in the last few days. So, um, we're hoping to roll that out now. Um, just under that deal sheet, we did get $1.2 million from the federal government to roll out the National Cultural Flows uh, Guide for Nations. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at rolling that out and it, it covers a lot of the nations in, in South West Queensland as well, so Goonery, Bidjara, uh, a lot of those Western western uh, nations and even the Gillable up, and, up, up around Warwick and Waka Waka and all those nations around Toowoomba and that as well. So it's a way that we're using the tool and all of those things, as I said, will we'll, we'll sort of uh, lead up or uh, feed up into a northern basin plan and they, then hopefully one of the things that we said in, in the northern basin um, and when we talked about the, the treaty and, and, and the union of nations we said we've got to treat ourselves as a nation we can't be a part of the Australian nation because we have to think like that if we go back to where we were we were sovereign nations we had it all you know, my law, when you're born, you get your land from your father, you get your totem from your mother. That's law. You know, we have a marriage system. If you broke that marriage system, you had, you had to pay the consequences under law. You know, and that was, I don't know if you said it, it was a living called you know. But in saying that, we are looking also at linking it to the 17 sustainable goals of the United Nations through what we call the SEER project. Um, we, we are looking at engaging a, a world um, expert on the ecosystem accounting. Um, he's worked with Fiji, he's worked with Uganda. He did a, um, a project in Uganda um, around mangroves to bring people out of poverty. Working with um, um, Kazakhstan, I think it is now, to, um, um, to bring some of that stuff out of poverty as well. So what we've thought is we're sick to death of government because government, you know, they come in, they give you a little bit of money. When you get, when you start to get successful, they pull that money away, and that's it. Was a classic example of that. So we've, we're taking a different step. We're taking a step of, of building everything that we do from the ground up, and First Nations do that. And then we, at the Northern Basin Aboriginal Nation, we then relay it. The other thing that we, we, we're looking at doing is doing an economic development strategy uh, that will assist the First Nations economically. So I noticed that they have Qantas and everything up there, you know. Um, so, you know, carbon credit. The other thing we, we, could, we could be looking at is, is green river corridors as well. So they're just some of the things that we're looking at. Uh, but one of the things that we do, and it's our absolute no-no, we don't get involved in nation business. That's that nation's business. And that nation can't tell another nation what to do, you know, as well. And when, when they come to our meetings, when they meet as a sovereign uh, union or sovereign first nation, they come in as representatives of their nations. Um, and we're hoping that you can open a whole, lot, a whole heap of stuff out up to international um, you know, funding such as the World Bank, the China Development Bank, um, you know, First Nations. One of my dreams um, would be, wouldn't it be great if we can have First Nation, First Nation trade? Why can't we trade our kangaroo over there to, to all the other countries, to First Nations and lately our agent for kangaroo? Yeah. And I've noticed something, in, and I'll finish with this, I've noticed something in all the presentations. The people that are doing things with our native foods and our native animals are not First Nations people. There are some First Nations people that are doing it, but the majority are not First Nations people. Thank you.
was just wondering, Frank, um, because we're interested in looking at what you know um, post-colonisation impacts have been on food fibre, and we hear a lot about the cotton. In terms of kind of particularly for the health of the Darling River, can you tell me what you think? What, can you tell me what you think is like one of the, a couple of the main things that need to happen to get water back into the Darling, particularly when it relates to cotton? Get rid of it. <laughs> That's you know. Um, it's a high, high use plant, <coughs> um, and if you look, I, I flew from, I, I normally fly around, but I was flying from Moree, uh, Sydney to Moree, and I looked out over the landscape, and all I could see in the distance is flickers of little dams mm, yeah. in the sun, in the sun, because the sun was going down, and you know, the amount of water that has been taken out of, out of the river systems, it's phenomenal. Like Covey Station holds more water than Sydney Harbour. I think they need to get away. I, I, I wouldn't have a, a, an issue with, with irrigation for food. But the majority of the irrigation is for cotton and food fibre, uh, and for fibre. And it's these big companies that are making money out of these huge investments. You know, and um, um, my my friend and uh, one of our board members, I don't know if you know, Michael Anderson, he always says that we've never seen it. We still own the water, we still own the land, so we should be the ones that controlling it. But in a system where we're, we're a capitalist society, it's the people with the most money that, that makes the most benefits out of it. But I think. You know, we have to reduce the reliance on water. And the best way to reduce the reliance of water on water is to look at a sustainable um, natural food source. And natural food sources are there. You know, we went out, when I, I put a couple of slides up yesterday, when we were, or the other day when we were talking, and we had the, the government people in the room. And when they came in, we all came in, I, I had some new cups. And, there's a, there's a young guy down in Bogabilla. Um, he's um, making tea out of the Yara bush, so, you know, and they're using the honey. So I filled it up with a tea bag and some honey. And I actually gave him a cup. And I said, he's a cup of them, he's an empty cup, and you fill it up with water. Then I asked him to sip it through the day. So um, he's a young gentleman that, that's wanting to, 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 to grow the, the Yara tree. And produce, and, and, and produce um, teas out of it as well. But it's also a medicine plant and all of that. So I think for us in Australia, we, we need to look at sustainable development. Um, we can't look at huge scale development and expect that Mother Earth is going to just um, you know, put up with it. And like that old fellow said in that video, he said, the Munda government is not happy at the moment because they are raping the system. So what he's doing is he's taking all that water away. And once we start looking after the system, then he'll bring that water back. So yeah, I think just sustainable, sustainable um, agriculture, you know, um, and we've seen the statistics with, um, with the kangaroo presentation, and I think that, you know, the amount of water that, that's needed for cotton is just unbearable. And I know Mary has a quick question, but um, I remember when your, um, I don't know if this was the nation or the, the complete connection of them, um, put their constitution together and had rights of nature in there. Can you very, very quickly tell people about that? I think a lot of people might not know. Um, we declared our independence in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and as a part of that, we've done two things. We looked around the world for, for the independence declarations. And we use the Israeli Declaration as a guide when we, when, we, when we declared our independence. And then we looked around the world for constitutions. <laughs> so there was a little island in the Pacific. And it's the island where Australia sends all their boat people now, Nauru. And we, we, we modelled our constitution on that. But we... When we're sitting down and we're, we're, we're discussing it and all that, that type of stuff, we said, who is the most important person on this planet? And we thought it was Mother Earth. And 
the rivers within the system. They're the veins of Mother Earth. And, you know, I know that um, New Zealand now is protecting their rivers. And there's another, uh, another country that's protecting uh, in their constitution as well. So we've also decided to protect Mother Earth in their constitution. Look, I don't know whether we'll ever get independence or not, but if we ever get independence, Mother Earth is looked after in our constitution. And, um, you know, when people come into our country, under our constitution, they are also responsible for Mother Earth, not only the, the, the government. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 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 I just didn't want to ask a question, just to say from our point of view from the other office, do um, you want to do more? And I know a lot of you do. Uh, I was looking at your, uh, the system that you just been describing. We're very uh, influenced and uh, encouraged by it because our other others are trying to do exactly the same thing to renew and re um, figure out our own government systems, um, working out our own um, ways of dealing within, with, with different um, groups within our home, but also with our neighbours and so on and so on. So, really bringing back, um, but really strengthening them too. But, and looking at these other things like the economy, economics and things, you know, how do we deal with that in our areas, respective areas, um, to the role of uh, other people in it, you know, um, our own uh, systems of power and authority, how does that work out? We had a bit of an experiment with the Commonwealth Games and so on, which were quite, quite successful, really, as we thought, um, at the time. And uh, I just want to say, I'll just regard what you've been saying, and I know you've heard you talk before in different forums, you know, but don't be agree, don't be agree with that, you know, I think it's, I think it's great, it's the only way we have to go, you know, because, um, yes, where I, I, you know, I've kind of stopped for my own personal political reasons, stopped using terms to do with sovereignty and um, self-determination, and even, sometimes even culture, I get tired of because it means everything and nothing. I, I, I've tended to use the term being owners and runners of the country. That's what we are. We've never always been that. We've never stopped being that. So we've got to do that more quickly in more concrete ways, absolutely concrete ways, and to, to make mainstream now that we are the authority in this country. All three percent of us as against 97 percent. I was just talking to the young lady up the back there, Annie Mary, out the front. and. Uh, one of the things that we looked at when we, we were looking at all of this stuff, we believe we have a legal right in this country under common law. And I was just telling her, and I applaud all of you, if you go to the High Court in Canberra, just have a look at the way the flags are flying at the High Court and the way that they're flying everywhere else around. And if you go to the High Court also and you, look, you walk into the High Court and you look up, and you walk up, there's a ramp that walks up. And when we, we went to the visit the High Court um, last year, and the guide that was taking us around, he said, and there's five paintings that are in the High Court on that wall. And he said, you know, after Marbo, they replaced the photo of the Queen. There was a big photo of the Queen in the High Court. They replaced that, and they put our Jukapa up there. Because Marlo said, our Jukapa, in our law, is not a construct of common law. It sits outside common law. And Marlo also said that the Crown did not gain absolute beneficial ownership to this land. And in brackets, and a labour of title. That sticks with, that stays with us. We've never given that away. And, and we still own the land over there, you know. And I, um, you know, I think that um, there are a lot more people out there now that are understanding that as well. We have a lot more support now as well. But I need to say, Mr. Yorani, that's an honour hearing that from yourself because, you know, um, you're a real respected person around this country. And for you to say that to me standing here today, I'll have Thank you. Thank you. I'd like, I would now like to invite Karen Shirley to come speak with us. Could you please tell us your name? 
Sheldon. Um, I'm a river ecologist and I'm a member of the Australian Rivers Institute at Griffith University. Could you talk to us about the impacts of irrigation on the Darling River system since European colonisation? Yeah. Okay, so um, as a river ecologist, I've been working on the Darling River ecological context since 1990 with a number of different projects. Um, and what I wanted to do today was take a much broader spatial look at the impacts of, of, flow, rate, well, of flow diversions and irrigated agriculture on the Darling. So rather than just going down into quite detailed numbers, um, to take a, a landscape perspective to what we're actually seeing. So this is a, um, just to put it in perspective around variability, one of the things that I think we are uh, getting uh, captured by in terms of looking at some flow statistics in, in rivers like the Darling is just how variable it is. So back in the 1990s, we did a project trying to come up with a context, so I'm just going to cough, <coughs> for how variable some of Australia's rivers are. Um, this is, we took 20 year hydrographs from a range of different rivers all around the world and then looked at how measuring the variability of those hydrographs and this is just a plot of the coefficient of variation which just standardises that measure across all of those rivers. And you see the first seven rivers, um, of all of those, five of them are Australian rivers and you can see where the Darling sits there in red. The two most variable rivers in the world were the Cooper and the Diamantina. And if you look on that plot, I've got another river, the Sea Daria, marked out, and that will become apparent as to why we'll look at that towards the end. But the Darling is a highly variable river in a world context. So um, if you're thinking about some of the water management and the water planning that has gone in in the Murray-Darling Basin as a whole, the early days were really just a river Murray story. So a lot of the significant things um, sort of pivoted around the Federation drought that really started to focus um, people's thoughts around water sharing. And it probably was, it was actually the reason uh, that really sharpened federation when Victoria and New South Wales were having a bit of a standoff over the River Murray. So the first major agreement was 1915 on the River Murray Waters Agreement, um, and that then established the River Murray Commission. And the Darling was pretty much left out of most planning right through until into the, well into the 60s. So the first realisation, I guess, at the basin scale of water was an issue was in 68 when South Australia put a cap on its diversions. The issues in the Darling really came to the fore in the 80s and of course the Old River Murray Commission was brought into the Murray Darling Basin Agreement was signed and it became the Murray Darling Basin Commission. Then the cap on water diversions in 95 um, and then in the 2000s we've had a run of different things leading up to the basin plan in 2012. So just the Darling story, um, again really nothing until 1968 when the Menindee Lake story was constructed and completed. And then you really don't get much happening in the Darling until the 1980s when there really was a massive expansion of cotton irrigation. Um, leading then into the mid-90s there was quite a bit of effort in water resource planning throughout the Northern Basin. Um, unregulated flow management plan for the Northern Rivers, the scientific expert panels placed in the Northern Rivers, and then a lot of water allocation management plans in the Queensland tributaries. And post the basin plan for the Northern Basin, there's been a sustainable diversion limit adjustment where they're sort of looking at exactly how much water can be diverted. So that's, I guess, some of the context for water planning. Cotton, as we know, has really taken off since the 1980s, but that graph really just shows how much it has increased even into the late 2000s. The, um, just the, the irrigated area in hectares and the number of farms irrigating cotton. And just, yeah, just go back. On the, um, the, the map on the side, you'll see the sort of um, locations of the cotton growing areas. They're in the lowland parts and on the floodplain parts of the river. And just keep an eye on that because the next slide I'm going to show has got the actual natural swamps and wetlands. So the Murray Darling Basin is a little bit strange. It doesn't flow to any particular large permanent water body. Um, the inland river basins are all like combinations of channels of complex wetlands. And if you look at what's highlighted on that map, you'll see that many of the, the tributaries actually end in a complex floodplain. So things like the wider wetlands and the flood out part of the wider before it actually meets the main channel, or quarry marshes, it does the same. You've got the lower below the floodplain and the narrow lakes complex, and so that needs to fill with water before it actually goes and reaches through to the to the Barwon Darling system. The Warrigo floodplain, the same. 
and further west, the Paru floodplain flows out into a massive um, sort of floodplain, water bodies and wetlands before very occasionally it spills into the Darling just upstream of Wolpano. And the whole thing sort of terminates in Malindi Lakes, which naturally would have been a cascading series of lakes with permanent to very ephemeral lakes that the water would have filled up before the Darling um, continued on down the main channel and the inner branch. So the whole system was this complex um, balance of ephemeral water bodies. So the wet, those wetlands function very much like sponges, fill and spill with these sequential floods that come through. So these are just some of the pictures that are a bit blurry of um, some of those wetlands. So if you look at some of the hydrographs, so this is from a very old notes of history of the Darling River um, that I've been dragging around for a while. You'll see if you look at the hydrograph rivers like the Darling, particularly the Lake Air Basin rivers, that the floods tend to occur in sequences. You get a cluster of floods and then a period of dry and then a cluster of floods. Um, and those flood clustering really relates to the La Nina cycles of ENSO. And so you'll even see since 1989 on the Darling, the, the hydrographs of the Canyon and Burke, you do have those series of floods and they do relate quite strongly to the La Nina phase. And that's really important. So what I'm going to show you now is my really bad graphics of how those sequences of floods work through those ephemeral water bodies, which are acting like sponges. So if you've got a dry time throughout the system, no flow, and then you get a small flood coming through. Now the first thing, most of the floods, are, uh, most of the rainfall is driven from the upper catchment because it's where the monsoonal incursions come down, it's the headwaters, it's the, the higher part. It fills those first water bodies around the narrow lakes, so a lot of condomine floodplain. As the flood moves on, if you get a flood again in the next year and no water is taken out, those water bodies are already wet. So the water gets to push further through the system. And then if you get another flood in that sequence, it will push further through the system down into the Nindy Lakes and then beyond into South Australia. So those sequences of floods are really important for the whole landscape hydrology of the system. So when you put irrigation on top of that, you actually change the whole way those floodplain wetlands are actually working in terms of being sponges. So if we just run through my bad graphics again, the water's actually pumped out in the northern basin after the first flood because it needs to fill the off-stream water bodies, which are the squares, the off-stream storages. And so those the second year, it will flood, and again, more water can be pumped out. Now, of course, if the second year flood's really big or the first year flood's really big, some of the water does get through. I'm a bit catastrophic with my graphics, but most of the water tends to get stuck in the system and the floodplain water bodies downstream don't tend to get the water and the water never seems to move down. So this is why when you start looking at things like the, you know, the, the dry spells, as you move further down the system, and so on the, the um, x-axis, the bottom of this graph, you've got Mungando, which is way up at the top, down to the canyon at the bottom, the period of dry spells gets longer as you go down because the water gets stuck in the upper part of the catchment and just doesn't get through. So this has got lots of words on it, don't worry about the ones on the, on the left, I'll go through those in a sec. One of the things that, um, the other part of variability in river systems is that you need the whole sweep. You can't just get stuck with the big flows, you need the small flows and the in, the in channel small, moderate and large floods as well as the overbank flows for the whole system to work. So if you look at the next figure, this is the pre-developed, well, modelled pre-developed data with um, baseline conditions for current development over the same five year period. And the blue is the pre-developed model data. And you can just see that the big events are still going to happen. The magnitude is decreased and that decrease relates to the amount of water diverted with some of it held in upstream storages. But where you really get impacts in the Darling is you get this, the, you know, the small in channel flows and the moderate flows are completely removed from the hydrology and the hydrograph becomes flat. So what does that impact? So the small in channel flows are really required to maintain fish in invertebrate populations and to mediate water quality. They keep the, the system in this you know, water quality, blue-green output, the blooms get decreased. The moderate in-channel flows are to do with connectivity. Fish populations can move and you can actually get connection and small-scale breeding events. And on that slide you'll see up to the right the uh, river mussel, Althari jacksoni, which was very common in the Darling, in the trunk of the Darling, between Brawarana and um, Menindi. 
in vast parts, I suspect it is now regionally extinct. It wouldn't, wouldn't have survived the really dry times that we've had in the last couple of years. That mussel can't tolerate drying at all, it needs permanent water. And with the river around uh, Hill Canyon being pretty much dry for quite some time, I suspect those populations have gone extinct. And if you actually stand on the bank of the river under Darling and you see the size of the indigenous middens along the bank, you realise the volume or the biomass of mussels that would have occurred in the system. And most of them are out of Lara Meadows. I think you'd be struggling to find them. And the large in channel pulses, again, mass fish movement and breeding events within channel and our overland flows are where we actually get large scale water breeding, fish breeding, and maintenance of a lot of the, the fish food chain in terms of zooplankton. Okay, and the impacts of wetland drying with not getting any water into them, of course, are felt most um, profoundly during times of drought. And it's not just surface water um, drying, it's also soil moisture drying. The longer those wetlands stay dry, the more water it takes to actually get them wet again. So you actually get a compounded effect. It's not even as if it's just got no water, the whole soil profile gets dried. So I just wanted to put this in context of something, and I guess a story that we all know and that is globally recognised as an environmental catastrophe, and that's the Aral Sea. So the Aral Sea was formerly the, one of the large, largest permanent lakes in the world, um, and it's now been, dis it's basically been reduced to a series of disconnected lakes. Vast areas are now dry, and there's major environmental consequences associated with the demise of that inland permanent water body. And it, as we all know, was a victim of irrigation. Diversions. Now remember back to my first slide about variability. The Sid area is one of the main rivers that um, flowed into the to the uh, Aral Sea, and the Sid area is not very variable. It's quite permanent and quite permanent flow, even though it's flowing through a semi-arid area. What happens with variability? So the Murray Darling is really our Aral Sea. So it's not. It's just not visually obvious because it's not permanent water. It's ephemeral water bodies. And because our lakes are ephemeral, we don't realise the actual loss of water within the systems because we're used to seeing them dry at a certain period of time. So if you look at the, um, that's a very bad graph over there, apologies for my low font. Um, that's the Aral Sea on the left and the Murray Basin on the right. So the diversion out of the Aral Sea, if you play around, I mean the numbers, it's always hard to get an exact number, is about 52%. Over the mean and in the Murray Basin, it's about 44%. So we're not too far behind the absolute environmental catastrophe that was the RLC, diverting on average 44%. The problem with the Murray Basin is that that is 44% of the long term mean flow, and most years we don't have mean flow. So in many years, the diversions are actually more than the inflow. So it's even more catastrophic than diverting 50% of a permanent flowing river system. So thank you, that was my broad landscape scale impacts of hydrology.
fauna is another thing. I think also riparian vegetation is going to really take a hit from, especially in that trunk of the Darling from just above the all the way down to, to Menindee. Um, and I do suspect that once those red gums are gone, we're going to be looking at an even bigger catastrophe because there's no recruitment at all. And many of those red gums are very old now. And I mean, the, the, the in channel flows actually provide riparian water to the red gums, which they do need, and many of them are not in a good condition. So, you know, you've got a very narrow line of riparian habitat, and that's just a naturally. So, it's basically one or two red gums thick. And if they go, then you've got no root mass holding the banks or anything. So, whenever there's a flood, the potential for erosion is massive, and so it just becomes compounding. Thank you. Taking of overland flow water, 
there was just uncontrolled expansion, a bit like the uncontrolled knocking down of native vegetation that Martin Taylor told us about this morning in the lead up to the introduction of laws covering native vegetation clearing. Can I have the next slide, please? And this is the result. This is the Darling River near Tilpa, taken by my friend um, Julie McClure, who's a grazier on the Darling. That was taken just a few months, few weeks ago really, not so long after a coordinated release of water from one dam in New South Wales and one dam in Queensland to back up onto a flow, a natural bed that was coming out of Queensland to make sure that enough water could be pushed down the river to save a whole lot of grazing businesses and to save a whole lot of communities from completely running out of water. It's pretty hard to imagine that this is the major artery of New South Wales. This is what keeps that country alive. And once upon a time, there was a thriving paddle boat industry that chuffed up and down here, um, carrying the wool clip from vast stations all over western New South Wales and southwestern Queensland. Can I have next slide, please? This is another result. Um, this photo was taken below Menindee Lakes. Um, this gentleman lives on a property called Abinul between Menindi and Wentworth, which is where the, the Darling River joins the Murray. Um, and you can't actually see it terribly well in this light, but that water is green slime. This is supposed to be stock and domestic water, but it is toxic most of the time. You can't drink it, you can't swim in it, you can't fish, you can't let your animals into it. It is that foul. I've seen signs on every single River Valley in the Northern Basin with cute little graphics warning you about contacting that water. And if that isn't a damning indictment of what Whitefellow Management has done to the Darling River, then I have no idea what is. This is a slide um, created by my friend Jeff Wise, who spent a lot of time as a Western Lands Commissioner in New South Wales. And this is all based on publicly available information and these are flow statistics from Wilcannia. Now Fred mentioned Wilcannia. Um, Wilcannia is about halfway down the Darling River. It's overwhelmingly an Aboriginal town and it's uh, a large community of Barkindji people. The Barkindji have, like Aboriginal people everywhere in Australia, a deep connection to their country and they have specific obligations to look after the river. Because of its geographic location on the Darling and below where all the northern tributaries join the Darling, the main trunk, Wilcannia wears the impacts of all the development upstream. And the point I want you to take away from this is the, the right-hand column, the decrease in reliability of water in Wilcannia. The blue columns towards the left are um, a record of 74, 74 years of flows from 1920 until, 1920, until 1994. And the grey colour are uh, the 22 years since 1995 when the cap on diversions from the Murray Valley Basin was introduced. And when you look at the bottom number, the reliability of water in Wilcannia has declined by 22%. That is an enormous drop in reliability. It's no wonder that the river is green slime and that people can't swim in it, fish in it, play with their dogs in it. I'm not surprised that Aboriginal people are angry and depressed. I'm angry and I'm not, a, I'm not someone that can speak for country or anything like that. I have, can barely imagine the grief that Aboriginal people must feel Faced with that and knowing that it is absolutely impossible for them to pass on their culture to the current generation. Culture is dying for want of water. And from where I'm standing, I don't think genocide is too tame a word. I'm aware that a couple of well-connected white fellas, politically well-connected and very well-connected business-wise, made representations to a certain New South Wales government minister and had the water sharing plan for the Bowen Darling changed in their favour. Two or three people did that, 
I'm not sure what the population of Wilcannia is, but they have been crying about the state of their river for a very long time, and those cries have been falling on deaf ears. I personally do not believe that that would have been the case if Wilcannia was a predominantly white community. One of the things that I think is so tragic about the impending loss of Indigenous culture is that encoded in your law, Fred, is a whole lot of ecological wisdom that holds the keys to how we live sustainably, how we manage our rivers in a sustainable way that will give everybody a reasonable quality of life, that will share the pain and the plenty, the burden and the bounty. And that's just right out of order. Something like that. Can I have the next slide, please? It's about uh, 15, 18 months now since Four Corners aired the episode called Pumped that blew the lid off corruption in the Murray Darling Basin um, and the illegal taking of water, the lack of compliance, particularly by the New South Wales government. Frankly, Tip of the iceberg, I'm watching this space with bated breath because I know that there is more to come and I can't wait for a very bright light and a very, very forensic examination to be made of exactly what has gone on. One of the, uh, so what we've seen, in my opinion, is a massive failure of public policy and the response from the New South Wales Government and the Murray Darling Basin Authority is to fix it with an engineering solution. Now, it has been in the media, but not a lot of people seem to be aware of it, but there is a pipeline just about completed, a half billion dollar project from Wentworth on the Murray to pipe water to Broken Hill, which used to get its water supply from the Menindee Lakes. The people of the uh, Menindee area, particularly the Barbadi people, do not want this pipeline. The people of Broken Hill don't want this pipeline. They're deeply suspicious of the motivations behind it. They are aware that uh, when the business case was put out to be reviewed by a major um, consulting firm, they found the business case to be extremely thin, wanting in a whole lot of detail and information. And by the way, where is the environmental impact statement? There are hopefully soon to be exposed reasons why this project is being rammed through. But part of it seems to be that we don't have to give any more water to the, to the Darling River because we can just pipe water up there and just let's forget about the fact that Menindee is not only one of the most important fish breeding um, uh, sites in the entire Murray-Darling Basin, it also has enormous uh, spiritual and cultural significance to Indigenous communities. Uh, to finish, um, I would like to tender a piece of evidence to the panel. Um, Fred, I was amused to uh, hear you mention a poem from Uncle Bill Riley called The Dying Darling. About 12 years ago, I travelled through, through the Darling Basin and interviewed many people um, and wrote a book called The Dying Darling, uh, which I think neatly sums up um, opinions of what's gone wrong and why um, and the thing that depresses me more than anything about having written this book is how much worse it is today. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Does the panel have any questions? Um, Sarah, you, uh, you, you talked about the sort of, um, I guess, uh, the difficulties you have with what's been going on and the background to that sort of stuff. Um, has, from your point of view, has the, the social determinants been a, a, a factor in terms of the calculation of what the impacts that are having on those communities across? that whole Darling Basin area. I mean, when you talk about the communities, you're talking about physical health, um, and that was mentioned in the today, but also the, the, the mental health, and that's escalated that's quite considerably. And, uh, and people have known that that's actually related to the changes in environment, and particularly water flows. Have you uh, 
um, would you tell us in some detail or somebody looking into that in terms of detail? Uh, that's a good question. Um, during the non-basin review process, which Fred and I were both involved in, the Murray Darling Basin Authority commissioned um, socioeconomic impact assessments of irrigation dependent communities. I thought it was deeply lacking that the benefits of returning water to the river was not assessed. The benefits that would accrue to floodplain grazing communities, to indigenous people, to the tourism sector, to the fishing, etc., etc., etc. Um, it's all, it's been all about the costs of the Murray Darling Basin Plan, not about the benefits. From a commercial point of view? From a, fi from a financial and economic point of view, yes. But I would say that people get emotional about water and I get very tired of people saying, let's have a discussion just based on the facts and let's not get emotional about it. Try saying that when you've got none. And Aboriginal people don't have access to much water. And Aboriginal people have a right to water. And we need Aboriginal people's wisdom to lead us out of the mess that we've got ourselves into. Um, I would also add that I thought it was deeply regrettable that the cultural flows research work that Fred was closely involved in was not completed in time for the Northern Basin Review so that the learnings from that work, which was wonderful, groundbreaking work for Australia, did not inform the Northern Basin Review at all. It's, it's really disappointing because I, I noticed that the Fred was talking about um, and the, the previous speakers that uh, the Red Guns would tell you the story. And if they go, you know, you're in deep trouble. I suspect it's too late for a lot of the black box, black box forests in the Darling part of the basin. But yes, um, I think I defer to Fran as an expert in these things, but if we don't get red gun recruitment very soon, then we probably lose those red gun forests forever, unless we're prepared to get out there and scan. It's very, very difficult to revegetate from scratch. Thank you. I just have one question, Sarah. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, if you were to point the finger at a couple of very direct, specific actions, what would you like to see happen immediately? Um, I would like to see the low and medium flows return immediately to the Bowen Darling River system, as Fran said and as um, Fred alluded to, the low flows have completely disappeared, disappeared from the pattern of flows. The medium flows have become low flows. The big flows have become medium flows. They, they can't, the, the irrigators can't do too much to the really big flows. But the length of time between those events is stretching out. And in-stream life in particular can't cope with that. So that would be the first thing that I would want to see happen. Um, I would also like to see something like a National Water Commission reinstated so that we have an independent, completely independent body to assess and accredit the new rate, the new generation of water sharing plans because frankly I don't believe the states are to be trusted um, and I'm not convinced that the Commission is either. And can I ask them more specifically? To get more flow down, we obviously have to stop diverting all the water out. Which particular um, industries or food and fibre activities do you think are most important to address? The issue is over allocation. Uh, I think Fran made this point. You know, take cotton out of the system, irrigators will grow something else. They'll grow whatever gives them the best return and is suited to their soils and climatic conditions, etc., etc., etc. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on water sharing plans. I'm unspeakably angry that New South Wales is about to licence and therefore legitimise a lot of the floodplain harvesting infrastructure, including some of those whopping great ring tanks, um, when if we are serious about returning the sustainable di di diversion limit is a first step. This is the first Murray Darling Basin plan. There will be others. This one is not good enough. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.
Barry Helms and Dr. Beryl Carmichael um, to speak with us. You'll just need to unmute yourself. You're speaking, um, you're up here on a big screen to about 60 people in the room here. Could you please tell us your name and where you are from? You'll just need to unmute. Thanks. Thank you. 
Because this one who came at me slaughtered. Thank you. <laughs> and what would you like to see happen? Well, what I'd like to see happen is uh, yeah, we, we want to stop. We don't want any more irrigation. Take the cotton back where they wrecked all the other rivers out of the Amazon and all around that way. Take all the cotton away from Australia. Take it back and let them suffer as well because people in their right mind would never ever dream of doing anything like this. What's happening today? The desecration and destruction leading to genocide of all life forms that's attached to the rivers. And we've got about six or twelve rivers. I have been this big wooden basin they call a chocolate back of the basin. The big strong pudding basin. And now 
have to learn the method is it correct? I'm um, getting on to you, these services, and the, the fast action people, because we have the descendants of the fast action people, we never say to their sovereign trick, and we still apply the our laws of no ways. So I'm trying to contact the human rights to work with me in some people. But I'm not up on the other. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you very much. Um, Barry, would you please say your name and where you're from? Oh. You'll need to unmute yourself. Have you got to say your name? Have one, just one going, and the other one muted. And maybe turn the phone off. And turn the phone off. Hi. 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 And uh, I was saying, from when the cotton first started to originate, but originally when the first water used to come down, you see all the dirty water coming out of the head of the river, and, uh, and eventually what happened, it gradually got worse, but then as time went on, as the cotton fields escalated, we noticed that uh, every time the water was going down the lake, which they said they had to uh, release it to South Australia, originally this lake in their behaviour. And uh, originally uh, we had a real problem and ever the water went we had this what they call blue green algae which really is a concoction of all the chemicals insecticides, homicides, herbicides, pesticides. Uh, they, this is quite frightening and now in this day and age we've got a situation whenever there's no water to release out of the lake which the water probably stays quite good in the moment of lake and release a bit of water down the river. At the moment the river will have to settle it only takes a few months now. These chemicals then to come to the floor with the, the clear water. The fish start to die. We're not allowed to swim in the river. We're not allowed to boat. We're told not to eat the yabby. We're told not to eat the fish. Don't let your dog drink the water. Just go on and on and on. And as that time has escalated, the property has got bigger and bigger and they have to be able to take that more and more water. But I'd just like to uh, go on to the, uh, the effects of it now. And I want to question the policies of the New South Wales Government, especially in Old Blair. Um, I went to a meeting in Broken Hill on the late August uh, 16, 17, and the parliamentarians here from the Animal Justice Party, and they were out here because they heard there was an animal cruelty, so I sat there and listened to it. And uh, eventually, there was just about a couple of kangaroos that had been wounded. And uh, anyway, I sat there and I got onto this eagle uh, being forbidden and all these birds and animals that went killed. But when I related that to this Mr. Pearson, he went back in the Parliament and also the fisheries hand directed that there's no water rack out here in our Darwin River. Now, he was asked by Honourable Mark Pearson about the water rack. And yes, the response was, by the look of on my advisor's face, is I'm alone on this. He then said, he'll go, he's got the best scientists, the best people in the CSIRO, and as they say that water rats, or small turtles, can't get in this tiny little in a ring of the Opera House Nest, I'll make their words, and he goes and says, how brilliant they are. Well, I've got a document here, in Mildura this year, the Victorian government now got a zero tolerance for illegal net. This is the legal net to use our father's reason, 
and there is thirty-eight thousand dollars fine, or two years in jail. I don't know yet. Next, the same minute, not aware. But they're actually being uh, in vogue for the last two thousand and three. So the late jail. Got some other things here about poisoning. Another thing that people are not going to want to hear: the Khaleesi violence. I've always been frightened what's going to impact. Well, that's just after hearing the BBC 30th of January this year, in 2016 17, four men in kangaroos in North and Broken Hill died, all sorts of sheep and goats. The uh, scientist of the land service, not scientist, he's a vet, he went on to say that the terrible pandemic and it could be the worst of anywhere in the world, couldn't relate to what it was. So they're covering up this pandemic. When I mentioned your friend, used to work on the National Park. He said back in 98 when he first broke out at the time, what? Yeah, he said, yeah, I used to go around and shoot 300 a week out of toll by the National Park, hiding in the tourists. So this pandemic broke out again. And I question this, this bulldog in this paper by the Fed and the government, they're actually covering this because if that was a disease as bad as he's saying in his article, those stations would have had to be quarantined. And uh, there's no way that sheep or cattle or anything would have been able to go off this property. So that's one thing. Now this lanai, I mentioned this lanai L. This is a thing that I mentioned to the uh, people from Sydney. Now what if I told them was, and watered it down when they got in the parliament, good people, but they watered it down, it's too big for They said that a man come in and said that lanai L can be uh, bought by anybody, you still can buy it right now, you can't, you can just walk in and you don't uh, need to or even have to give your name. And uh, they basically uh, watered that down and said, they didn't say what I did say was that the National Park in conjunction with the Wild Dog Board and the land services were distributing this to all the pastors in all the people in Western New South Wales. Now I've got here, this is still current right now, they've got 10 acres 1080 signs on the Broken Hill Road. This is current. This poison's laid there from the 10th of the 4th, 18 until the end of November. Now, have a look on the bottom. Caution, non target animals may be affected. Now, they use the word wild dog. They're not allowed to say the most because it might upset someone. Now, no one out here can my money that I've spoken to has ever seen one dingo on the Broken Hill Road. A chap cut. A horse and cart in an India a few months ago. The story was he had this beautiful dog doing all tricks for the kids. He was born. When he went out on the road, mate put him with a mother on his dog. He said, Yes, I will, mate. Have a long story short. You know what the history is. He got out the road. He knew where this, this comes from. So their policy, they haven't got a clue about anything. And as I said, the same thing with the, with the water resident Brown. He's now a two, a two years car. And, uh, yeah, 38 thousand dollars And that's the evil business in uh, Victoria. I actually sent a letter down there. And the Greyhound, the Greyhound legislation. I went to that meeting, and when I told them all this about what this land was killing, yeah, but they're looking away now. Look. Um, probably one more minute here, Barry. Did, is there something else you want to say about the Darling River system? We've got about another minute here. Well, we stopped chemicals coming in. This land is one of their main chemicals. And uh, the Minister recently said, Mark Coulton, he said that Roundup is a magnetic and for agriculture. Now, we all know what Roundup story is there, so. Most of the big question is that they haven't got a clue. I've got that many of their documents where they've been proven and it's quite frightening that they're still there. I'm not even wrong. But that's the reason to be fair to Thank you very much, Barry. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, now we're just going to see if we've got um, another speaker, I think, by phone or Zoom. No, um, Mary Ann Snowy sends her apologies. She's going to um, leave the texting. She is actually a senior water researcher now at the Australian Institute, but was a whistleblower on the Murray Darling Basin Commission um, and was featured in a Four Corners show uh, about the, I'm just being very careful with my words, about the actions taken by different government authorities and both the legality and the morality of some of the work that they've been doing. So what we're going to do is, by the next week or the, the week after, I think we'll do a longer Zoom interview with her and put that on the tribunal website. So um, we've now got Bruce Lindsay's um, presentation pre-recorded about the legal system and the impacts of how those governance structures fit around all of these very complex issues. So, someone who's playing that? Is that you, Mary? Mm -hmm. Well done. You're doing great. Thank you for joining us. Could you please tell us your name and professional qualifications? Uh, yes, my name is uh, Dr. Bruce Lindsay. I'm a lawyer with the Environmental Justice Australia. Um, I've got qualifications in law, but I'm a graduate, postgraduate of PhD in law. I've uh, also gone into this exercise like a Master's of Environmental Science. From your professional viewpoint, could you please provide an overview of the legal system governing the Murray Garden Basin today? Yes, yeah, so if I could take you to the slides, um, what I'd like to do is go through the slides and have them at the bottom of the board. I've been doing the Board of Governments in the Murray Garden Basin, and I've got a slide here in respect of um, the data in particular. Uh, so I want to take people through the issue of Board of Governments in the Basin. So I'm going to go to the first slide. Um, this is their representation of a system which is probably quite familiar to a lot of people uh, here. Um, the Basin system is, you know, a large. Um, uh, catchment and it contains many sub catchments um, that runs from Queensland through New South Wales, uh, the ACT, uh, Victoria, and into South Australia. Broadly, the system drains from the west of the Great Dividing Range uh, uh, or the north in Victoria uh, through the Murray system and joins with the Darling system around Wentworth um, and then drains through South Australia down to the Kuron Lakes. Um, in, um, in South Australia. So that's the geographic area that we're dealing with and the regulatory framework, the government's framework we're dealing with, with covers this geographic region. The, the next slide I'll take you to, um, I think deals with sort of some of the context that we're dealing with in the Murray-Darling Basin, um, but, uh, to which governance questions relate or why they've arisen in the form that they have. So the Murray-Darling Basin system um, is the largest um, agricultural producing um, catchment or system in Australia. Uh, it's very productive in that sense, but I think we can probably describe the, the system as it's been uh, affected by widespread industrialisation. So we call this industrialisation of the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, this has led in particular over the last um, century or more to extensive modification of the eco-hydrological systems in the basin, so both the ecology and the hydrology of the system. And as you can see by some of these pictures, that uh, modification has been in the forms of constructive works, dams, weirs and so forth, extensive extractions for uh, irrigation and also town water supply and so forth. There's been quite considerable drainage schemes and so forth. So I think the first point of um, thing to bear in mind is that the system that we're talking about in the basin is highly modified, uh, by, especially by um, large-scale engineering of the landscape. Um, I think further points that are important to note in this industrialisation and modification are the extensive um, clearances, uh, if you can call it that, at First Nations through the, um, uh, the 19th century in particular. Um, there's large widespread populations of First Nations people throughout the region. There still is uh, tens of thousands of First Nations people living in the, in the basin, but of course their lives, livelihood and way of life are extensively disrupted through the 19th and 20th century in particular. Um, there's large-scale sediments in the wake of that, um, including by after the war soldier settlers. Water law in this context um, and water governance has been a real important facilitator um, of that modification and industrialisation of the landscape. 
Consequences of that um, dynamic have been very profound in the basin landscapes, um, in particular, and partly the reason why we've come to a situation of federal intervention in governance of the basin is there's been extensive uh, over, large scale over extraction of water resources uh, in the basin um, through the 20th century and just became particularly evident in the so called millennium drought in the 2000s. Um, where there was widespread um, extraction or over extraction of water resources leading to the crisis um, and the collapse of various ecosystems um, in the basin. Um, if we can go to the next slide, in addition to simply there being no water, um, the other ecological consequences of over extraction and industrialisation have been uh, eutrophication events. Um, uh, large-scale salination, salination of, of land and so forth. So widespread ecological disruption, which has led to both ecological problems, but also productive problems for industries like agriculture. Um, I'll come to the consequences of that in as legal, legal responses to that in a minute. But I think, in, first of all, before we go to that, it's important to consider um, how in Australian law uh, water is managed. Primarily what we're talking about um, in this presentation is the, um, the laws relating to water resources and water management. Um, importantly in Australia there are sort of constitutional um, uh, dimensions to water management um, and distinctions between federal and state jurisdictions within a federal system. Um, the Australian Constitution provides for um, limitations on the Commonwealth's role in water management. So the Commonwealth, as it, this slide indicates under section 100, shall not by any law or regulation of trade or commerce reach the right of a state or of the residents therein to the reasonable use of waters or rivers for conservation or agriculture. The consequence of this is a continuation from the um, colonial period of states having primary responsibility for water resources management. Um, that's particularly important in terms of the allocation of rights to take water and control water resources. It's also been an important control or limitation on the Commonwealth being involved in this space until um, 2007 in our legal sense. Um, so if we just briefly look at the state's role in water management, because it's particularly important if you're looking at um, the Murray-Darling Basin and also uh, uh, irrigated agriculture and that kind of production in that system. Um, first of all, in general, um, there's some sort of underpinning uh, dimensions to state water law. Um, all jurisdictions in Australia, including those in the basin, um, have uh, water statutes that are that are um, control and manage water resources within those jurisdictions. Um, First of all, we have inherited and brought into the statutory form or into legislation a, distinguish, a distinction crucial to, essential to English law is that the separation in legal sets, legal terms of water and land as resources. Um, this is very important in terms of the way in which water uh, is managed and rights in um, water are vested. Um, secondly, um, as a departure from the English system in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, the Crown or state governments um, acquired through statute, through legislation, the primary right to water. So the Crown is the, the primary, water is vested primarily, or in the first instance, in the Crown, and then the Crown by ministers, water authorities, and so forth, grant rights and interests in water to take or store or construct works over it. So that's in the form of all sorts of different instruments, water entitlements. Um, water licences, um, other types of water rights, for instance. Um, and those are essential to the management of who can take water, how much water they can take, when they can take it, and so forth. Um, the management of water resources uh, over the last 20 or 30 years has also been sub subject to various forms of statutory water planning. Um, and this has been a very important response to the ecological constraints and limitations uh, of the use of water resources in those various jurisdictions. Um, what water planning is called in different jurisdictions can differ, and the instruments that do it can differ. Um, and water planning is also a very important phenomenon as we come to at the federal level now. Um, finally, planning and decision making um, 
in respect of water planning and decision making has increasingly been guided at least principle by um, models of ecologically sustainable development. So that's the broader overview of the state's role in water management. What I want to come to next um, to inform um, the tribunal is um, the national role or the now national role of national intervention into water governance. So there has actually been a very long history of what are called intergovernmental agreements uh, between the Commonwealth and um, basin jurisdictions in relation to managing water in the Murray-Darling Basin that go back to the early 20th century. These are largely political agreements, however, um, without, necessarily, without legal consequences at the Commonwealth level. However, especially as a response to the ecological crisis and the over-extraction um, in the 2000s, the Commonwealth and the Howard Government intervened and passed uh, the Federal Water Act or Commonwealth, the Water Act 2007. Um, this is a very important intervention. I'll come to some of the key elements in a minute. Uh, but it's important to bear in mind, given the point made about the constitutional constraint mentioned earlier, what were the constitutional bases for the Commonwealth to intervene in this context? Um, there are a number of these, quite a long list of these, but the headline constitutional bases were um, the use by the Commonwealth of environmental treaties. Um, the Commonwealth can legislate for ex matters related to external affairs. So it used treaties like the Biodiversity Convention, Ramsar Convention relating to wetlands as key tools for leaders to intervene in respect of water management. Uh, it also negotiated with the state the referral of a number of important state powers in respect of, of water management as well. As I said, there are many other bases, but those are headline ones. The issue of environmental treaties is particularly important because it, in some respects it identifies or characterises the Water Act and the Basin Plan, which I'll come to, as environmental uh, statutes. So, and so there's an important environmental component um, to, the, to the Water Act. So in terms of some of the characteristics or key elements of what is in the Commonwealth Water Act and what it's intended to do, um, there's some quotes here from extracts from provisions in the Water Act. Um, first of all, the key sort of statutory fact that underpins the Water Act is a statement in there that, that use of basin water resources has had significant adverse impacts in conservation and sustainable use of water. Um, so that's kind of a premise on which the Commonwealth Water Act proceeds or has proceeded. Um, and further, there's also the sort of purpose, the principle of what the Water Act is intending to achieve in a broad sense, which is to promote the sustainable use of water resources. And as you can see, in terms of its protective and restorative functions of ecosystems, it very much um, uh, reproduces the flavour of the, uh, instruments like the Biodiversity Convention and the Ramsar Convention. So it's very much an environmental flavour to some of the purposes uh, of the Water Act. Um, in terms of key operational elements of the Water Act, a key uh, uh, mechanism is that the Water Act, through other instruments like the Basin Plan, which I've come to, actually will in, impose limits on the extraction of water um, uh, to what are identified as sustainable levels. Um, these are what are known as sustainable levels of, of take, um, and um, that is represented in, reflected in sustainable diversion. So they're effectively cats on how much water can be taken out of various water systems. Um, in addition for that, there are mechanisms to provide for concepts or models of environmental water that is water used for environmental purposes. So, just in, as I, in a bit more detail, I'll go to some of the key features of the Water Act um, scheme. It establishes the Independent Statutory Authority, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. Uh, as I said, it establishes a scheme of caps on water extraction in sub-catchments and basins within the basin, as well as in the basin, Murray-Darling Basin overall. Uh, these are known as sustainable diversion limits. Um, the intention of these, and it's highly politicised um, settling on a particular number, so there's quantitative controls and limits uh, on, on diversions, and these are intended uh, ultimately, uh, the diversion limit for the entire basin is around 10,000, a bit over 10,000 gigalitres a year, which requires or will require over a period of time the recovery of. 2,750 gigalitres in new port environment. But that 2,750 gigalitre target is probably one of the highly contentious points 
of what the Federal Water Act and Basin Plan Scheme do uh, is to set that limit and that control. Um, there has been um, increasingly, or over time, controversy also over whether the method for setting that number is correct in a legal sense, and that's been questioned recently uh, in the South Australian Royal Commission into the Murray Darby Basin. Um, environmentalists generally say the number of uh, recovery number is too low, it should be higher, and brigaders, for instance, say the number is generally too high, it should be lower. So it's a point of enormous contention and highly politicised. Um, within uh, the Act also creates a detailed scheme of legally binding water planning in some respects in addition to quantitative caps. Um, this nested governance framework is a central pillar or a central um, dimension of the Water Act framework. By nested governance essentially means that you have different mechanisms, legal mechanisms um, undertaking the water management function at different scales, um, spatial scales, um, and doing so in slightly different detail. So um, the Water Act requires the preparation of what's called the Basin Plan, which occurred in 2012, which is a statutory uh, planning framework for the entire Murray-Darling Basin, um, and sets that recovery target and sustainable diversion limits above. In addition, uh, what it does, the Water Act and the Basin Plan require the preparation of 30 water resource plans, which are the more regional, localised planning instruments that will operate within particular water systems. Um, there are 14 surface water resource plans and 16 groundwater ones. And these are to be completed by the middle of 2019. Um, they were intended to be commenced in 2012, so there's been a sort of a long lead time in the preparation of these instruments. These instruments are quite crucial to the actual delivery of the overall sustainability goals of both the Basin Plan and the Water Act. They do the localised work of achieving sustainability with a purported achievement of sustainability. Um, there are sustainable diversion limits, um, as I said, with respect to the basin as a whole, but also each water resource plant area has its own sustainable diversion limit, um, which is an estimate uh, in a quantitative form of how much water can reasonably be extracted or diverted from the water resources in the rivers and groundwater and so forth from those areas. There has been um, uh, processes put in place to adjust uh, a particular limit the amount of water recovered for the environment, and this is what's looking good. Is what is called the SDL adjustment mechanism. I won't go into the, the detail of that, it's highly complex, but again, it's been a mechanism, a highly politicised mechanism, aimed at adjusting those quantitative caps or controls over how much water can be extracted from water systems, so from rivers and uh, groundwater systems within the basin. Um, finally, and importantly, I won't go into this detail, um, the Water Act establishes the environmental watering framework, including a statutory body called the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder, who holds, has water, specific type of water entitlements, uh, known as environmental water holdings, uh, which are used um, uh, in order to achieve environmental purposes. So their flow is held in storages, uh, and dams, weirs, and so forth by the water holder that is used subject to the watering environmental watering mechanisms, plans to achieve environmental purposes for cut plans, particularly in some few ones like irrigation and so forth. Um, so, uh, so to go back and say that's the, the broad general uh, governance scheme and legal scheme um, for management of the Murray Darling Basin system. Um, within that scheme, I think it's important to distinguish um, how, say, um, different types of um, uh, water is often understood in terms of the uses to which water is put, um, in terms of it's diverted or extracted or stored from particular systems within these highly modified and highly engineered systems, um, and that is in order to use it for particular types of purposes. Um, the use of water for the industrial purposes, so that might be Irrigated agriculture, 
uh, might be mining uses, uh, might be horticulture, those kind of uses. This is often referred to as consumptive uses. In addition, um, the extraction and storage and use of water for uh, water supply for populations, uh, town water, uh, is also considered to be a consumptive use. So that's a particular set of the uses or the reasons why water is controlled. Um, in many, many contexts, that is the largest single use of water within a particular system, uh, especially when you have large-scale irrigated agriculture and large dams that are constructed for that purpose. Um, there's other types of water uses. Um, often the key distinguishing one is what's called environmental uses. So we have the water that is either under plans or licenses or entitlements used for it to achieve environmental purposes, so to flood wetlands, for instance, or to uh, stimulate breeding events of uh, water birds or fish or, or things like that. They're considered to be environmental purposes. Now, I explain that because uh, the last slide I've got here is in some respects relates to this particular circumstance of the Darling River, or the Baka, as it's referred to um, by the Indigenous language. Um, and uh, it's also been a river that's been subject to a particular um, controversy uh, because of um, uh, the level of tape and the nature of industries on that river system. Um, at the state level, as I've explained, the water arrangements uh, operate in use cases occurs in respect of New South Wales because the system entirely operates within New South Wales. Well, it's tributaries that operate in Queensland as well, but let's deal with New South Wales for current purposes. Um, the Darling system is subject to what are called water sharing plans in New South Wales, also water access licences. So both planning regimes and licensing regimes that permit uh, and control the take of water out of the system. Uh, what has been particularly controversial is the level of power and um, exercise by irrigated interests in um, both the setting of um, levels of take out of that system and also the way in which take has occurred and for what particular industries. Um, the largest single industries that take water out of that system are for cotton production, and some great rice production for cotton. As I understand this, uh, I think in the mid 2000s, more than 90% of the take out of the Darling, out of the Darling system, was for cotton growing on a very large industrial scale. Um, so those interests are very powerful. I won't go into the detail of the controversies that have gone in the system there, but the, um, and they're still under uh, judicial proceedings. Some of those things in terms of legal take or take um, in the in excess of what was permitted under licences. Um, there's been controversies over the extent to which those irrigated interests have been um, influenced over the setting of levels of take and also taken beyond what they were permitted, that is to say, illegally, um, beyond the limits or at times they were permitted to do so. Um, that has led to some spectacular examples such as what book has played scale extraction and virtual empty that some of those parts of that river system. And also, you know, obviously had very detrimental and profound consequences not only for the environment in that system, but also for downstream users in places like Broken Hill, um, who have almost run out of water as I understand it, and also um, has been particularly powerful for significant consequences for the Barkindji, the indigenous people on that river, who is, whose existence depends very much on the association with that river. So that death or compromise of the integrity of that river is very much associated with them. It is detrimentally impairment of their culture. Um, at the federal level, you know, there is also, as is required across the entire bar basin plant system, requirement for the preparation of water resource plans under the Commonwealth Water Act. Now, um, interestingly, even though water resource plans are required to be prepared and approved by the year 2019, there is enormous lag in their preparation at the moment. So the, there's a number of water resource plans to be prepared that relate to the Darling River system. The one on the Barwon Darling, which is sort of in the middle upper part of the, that system in central western New South Wales, um, is intended to reduce take uh, by six, uh, sorry, yes, yeah, six gigalitres per year. Um, so uh, from 198 gigalitres a year of diversions to 192, 
Um, the lower darling also has reductions in tape that are going to be required over time that will be the set, a central feature in many respects of what the Commonwealth Water Resource Plan will require. Now, as I look at doing the research on this today, um, I see that there's only about 30% confidence at this point in time uh, from the Murray-Darling Basin Authority that this water resource plan will be prepared in a timely manner, that is to say by the required deadline in 2019. So there's enormous, there is quite a significant question mark over that preparation of that water resource plan and, and it is prepared to... Um, because um, Bruce has covered up some of the key issues I think we needed to cover today because it's so late, um, we might actually just press a pause but the whole, his whole presentation will be on our website as we all digest things. I'm just trying to apply some human compassion here to the time of day. Um, I do love lawyers, we do love to talk, don't we? But with not any disrespect to Bruce's overview, I mean, the complexity of the issues he's talking about, I mean, I think the thing that's definitely struck me is just the sheer complexity of state-based, federal and other legal structures, and all of them have failed the communities and the natural world around this water. It's, it's quite diabolical. But anyway, um, maybe can I let you kind of just conclude this session, and then we'll do some of our initial responses and release us all back into the wild on our Saturday evening. I'd just like to um, thank all our speakers this afternoon for providing us with a detailed overview of the devastating impacts of large-scale agriculture on the Darling River system, but also insight into the complexities and connections of the communities that form that system. Now, we ask the panel to conduct public hearings in the Murray-Darling Basin with a particular focus on the Darling River and the Nindy Lakes to provide an opportunity for the communities to voice their concerns. Thank you, Maggie, and thank you, everybody. Let's give that session a big clap. <laughs>
but surely creatures that have evolved on this beautiful continent since before Gondwana land and continue to survive um, our onslaught today are part of our system much more than cattle, sheep, goats, and we must find a better way forward. So um, our Earth Advocate Isaac invited the panel to open up a session for several months to actually invite people around Australia to share their stories from their bioregions about the impacts of agriculture. And I think we will do that to the best of our ability. Just recently, um, Gil, myself and Revel were involved in the International Permanent People's Tribunal on the Impacts of Fracking on Human Rights. And a woman here in Australia called Shay Dougal ran an incredibly effective online process where people could upload oral testimonies and upload written testimony and something like 60 different folks or witnesses or groups were able to share their information and that was part of it. So I think that might be some initial um, response from this panel will be to open up that process and um, we'll think about the timeline for that and share that with our broader networks but there's obviously a lot for us to digest. Um, I won't talk much longer but I just wanted to say that obviously for the um, for the Murray-Darling Basin it's been a national shame for decades our complete mismanagement of this place, these places. Um, in the last few months, as Ayla has been approached by communities up and down the Darling River and across the Murray, um, and I'm absolutely humbled to have been part of a group that's been invited to go down there next year. Um, as Maggie has indicated, we, we have been invited to go down and just to open a space to bear witness to what the heck is going on and to allow um, any First Nations peoples and any community folks who want to, to come forth and share their stories in public places with each other. Um, and then we can compile some of that material with the help of the local folks to tell that story separate from government interference, separate from the alleged corruption that's going on between corporations and governments. So they're my initial responses. Um, it's been a really profound day and I'm truly grateful for everyone who's been part of it to Warren and Fred who came and spoke for country and for their regions, we're deeply grateful. And for everybody else, I'm really, I think I'm about to go home and have a really large gin and tonic, it's been intense. And I'm gonna go and think about the quolls that used to live on Gary's land and they're gone. I'd like to see those quolls come back one day. That's what I'd like. Mary? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, all I can, I can remember everything you said, but I agree with everything you just said. Um, also, I'm, um, Oh heavens, it's um, it's really depressing, isn't it? I mean, you know, I think I've reversed my original when I first came in, <laughs> talking about the you know the the uselessness of having a revolution. Now I think that's actually what we <laughs> what should happen. <laughs> actually, I mean, it was very encouraging, and uh, I thought it was wonderful. You know. Um, older um, Aboriginal people getting really angry there, and older white people getting really angry there. <laughs> um, it's very encouraging, it's great, you know. Um, but, and also, um, you know, that there are so many people, uh, black fellows, of course, our, our own mobs, uh, I know they've always been fighting back, but also a whole, whole lot of very positive, um, clever ideas uh, among mainstream about fighting back too, you know. Um, oh, it's just it's just made me think a great deal about a whole lot of things. And I I wanted to ask um, actually, actually sorry, um, Gil, um, no, well, make a comment about, actually about because your experience of around the whole globe in, in all sorts of terrible areas, uh, and I can't help thinking about all of what we've been talking about or, and been listening to. Is a, a, it's a big global system of a constant war on the environment, on the world, on the land itself. Constant no, a, a normalisation of that war, actually. Normalisation of war against peoples, in that they go hand in hand. Um, a, com a, 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 const a relentless a commodification of the whole of life and a kind of quantification of culture itself. They all go along hand in hand, and it's a large global problems. And I mean, you are, you've travelled around the whole world and seen all this. How on earth do you start this without um, going into battle with the, with the states, uh, with a small s, you know, with the state and their compromised position with, and the compromised position of media too, 
with the, you know, corporations. Where do you start? Where do anybody, you know? Good where question you, for Gil. I'm glad you've been asked that question, Gil. <laughs> um, well, I'm no Lenin, so uh, <laughs> I, I'm uh, not going to be at the barricade soon. But uh, yes, well, I agree. I mean, your analysis uh, was wonderful. That, that that is the situation we face. I think um, what is important and what impressed me was was the the amount of energy and thought and organization that is pushing back in this country and, and I was probably unaware of much of it and I think that's probably one of the most important outcomes of, of this session which was all, all day it was was wonderful I think um, and will give us uh, the, the, the basis for, for going forward and, and, and in the ways that uh, uh, Michelle has suggested uh, it, it's I mean, being a lawyer and being on a tribunal, I guess I have to sort of sum up, in a way, what I, what I think has been decided. <laughs> Others may disagree, I, I doubt it. Um, I, I think the evidence w was comprehensive, um, and it showed that the, the situation is dire. Uh, there needs to be a transformation of, of uh, agriculture in this country, and uh, the only way that, that the positive things that we need to happen will happen is for people to resist, organize, publicize, condemn, and think hard about the fundamental causes of our grief. Mm -hmm. So let's go for it. Thank you, Kim. Ross? You want Gwyn to go Good. first? Okay. Oh, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I, I just wrote down some concluding remarks. Um, so, as I said, the, this tribunal has um, started a conversation forcing a critical re-evaluation of our food production systems. Today, we have initiated a, an appraisal of the impact that industrial-scale agriculture is having on our continent. Um, at the heart of this dialogue are our fragile Australian ecosystems with indeterminate uh, boundaries and ecosystem services that sustain all life forms. We've heard of the Brigalow Belt bioregion transformed by um, farming, sorry, transformed for farming purposes and enduring ecological and human harm inflicted with the putative knowledge that these practices are unsustainable. We've heard how Australian agricultural practices have presided over and been complicit in the conduct that has, has altered, fundamentally altered Australian wetlands and our interconnected ecosystems. We're told of direct uh, environmental assaults on the Darling River system uh, coupled with the more insidious and far-reaching malfeasance of land clearing, disturbing our ecological balance of whole districts, accelerating biodiversity loss and advancing an intensive form of food production with enormous associated reliance on chemical herbicides. We've heard from speakers who tell of industrial... Um, who tell of Sorry, we have heard from speakers who tell of industrial scale farming practices that make a clear nexus between human agency and the destruction in whole or in part of precarious ecosystems. We've been told of our, that our environmental protection laws are grossly inadequate, fragmented and conflicting. Whether designed or manufactured, our laws promote a pro growth paradigm. We would appear to be without a legal protective framework or a proactive master plan. We answer Cormac Cullinan's uh, call to imagine a new world where the best interests of the community as a whole is the overriding consideration. Um, this is not a tribunal of accusations or recriminations, but a restorative and remedial justice forum. 
Whilst people's courts cannot make binding decisions, this tri tribunal can nevertheless support the efforts of communities across the world to seek justice by providing a forum to illuminate the challenges associated with selective case studies that we've seen today, to give a prognosis, to make predictions, to pursue closer examination of the evidence and make uh, recommendations. All interested parties, as I understand it, will be invited to make submissions in, uh, relating to the two case studies in the ensuing months. Um, I look forward to reading those oral and written testimonies and submissions um, forwarded to the AILA website. Um, I concur with the, the tribunal's uh, recommendation to have uh, a people's tribunal in the uh, Murray Darling, uh, in the Darling River and, and Menindee Lakes region. Um, uh, and I and, um, anticipate that the tribunal will deli deliver its recommendations in due course. Uh, as a personal note, I'd like to thank the speakers, the volunteers, all the civic society groups, and the participants who have contributed to this tribunal. Uh, but most importantly, would like to thank the First Nation uh, peoples who've been so generous uh, in sharing their knowledge systems their ecological wisdom, and for their speaking for country. Thank you, Can I just make um, just a couple of observations about today? Um, it's really honed in the, the fact that it's a, t it's a take society. It's just take, take, take. Nothing's actually given back, pretty much like any extractive industries around the planet. Um, it's just take, take, and take. Um, and there's a and there's consequences and there's destruction associated with that particular behaviour. We've seen that particularly with the industrialised um, society with its extreme acceleration since the 1950s. The, um, my real concern is, is the planet is losing its rights. Um, and the consequence of that, we're losing our own cultural identity, cultural rights, in terms of just being people. Um, and with the consequences of some of the stuff that we've talked about today is the human rights. You all have human rights in this room. Um, and uh, and I noticed that through disempowerment is where a lot of that's coming from. It's who holds the power, who holds the control, um, and obviously that's government administration and so forth. The major concern that I guess that I sort of um, come out of today and it was resonated with uh, Artie on the video is around the social determinants. Um, people not being able to do, and the old gentleman not being able to do, take a yabby, not being able to go fishing, not being able to do boating, not being able to swim, not taking your dog down to the river. Those are all critical factors in terms of a healthy environment and a healthy society. Those are taken away, and from taking those sort of types of things away, and Artie also mentioned around uh, suicide uh, in the, the broader society and mental health generally, that's uh, really resonated with me today. I think those, those social determinants as a community, just in that Darling Basin alone is, is, is phenomenal. I don't, I don't even really want to know what the statistics are. But those social determinants are critical factors. And it's the old saying, um, and, and, and it's really true, is that a healthy planet means healthy people. And right now, we don't have um, either of those, and we're getting worse. Um, but in saying that, um, I always um, think about this in the glass half full, and um, and I think the glass half full is here, and I reckon we should bring on a red gum inquiry. Oh, I like that, the red gum inquiry. Okay, so look, I would really like to thank my lovely colleagues up here today. We've, um, I guess, sat here to listen and to share and to provide a platform for future discussions. This isn't the end, it's the beginning. Um, and I guess some simple issue is if you registered for the tribunal, you'll be on our list and we'll be kept up to date. If you haven't, shoot us an email um, and we'll be opening up a little portal on the website to continue these um, activities and let you know when other pop-up situations will be available for you to be part of. Um, I think on that note, and given the time, with deep gratitude, I'd like to say thank you to everybody. I now declare our tribunal closed and the pub open. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your time, everybody. Thank you so much.
Thank you.